This is intended as a short video in preparation for paper four for A-level psychology. Let's just jump into the most important piece of advice that I have. So if there's one slide or one idea that you consider, it should be this. In both the old and the new syllabus, we actually are directed that the second paper of A-level year, paper four, will choose different topics than those given in paper three. This has always been true for the 9990 syllabus. It's not a secret, though some people may feel like it's cheating to do this. But what you may want to do is think about what questions were asked of me on paper three. Or better yet, what questions or what topics were not asked of me on paper three. So take a moment, think about what was given on paper three. I felt personally disappointed in paper three because there were no key studies in paper three for the two electives or the two units that our students had done. And I feel like that's a lot of invested time that didn't yield much in terms of like ext extrinsic results. Okay, of course we study for the sake of studying, but of course we also wanna do well on exams. So that being said, um, in the syllabus, and I can read this verbatim just to make sure we got this absolutely clear. The questions are based on two topics or subtopics within each specialized option. The topic areas for each specialist option will be different of the topic areas assessed in paper three. So I'm spending some time just repeating this because I think it's an important point to make. When you study, you likely want to prioritize the things you were not asked about. And that'll save you a lot of time and it'll give you a lot more depth and focus on the things that are likely to be asked. It feels a little bit like cheating, but it's not because it's directly in the Cambridge syllabus. Okay, so now that we have that important piece of advice, you could stop the video if you want to, or we can keep going just to look at the paper as a whole, and maybe I'll sneak some more advice in there as we go forward. First of all, this paper is broken up into two parts, section A and section B. Now, section A says choose two specialist options, and I put the word choose there in quotes because I think most schools, most students, most teachers concentrate on only two of the four specialist options. I'll be curious to know if there are schools out there that do three or maybe even four. I have tried to do three before, but usually that's some sort of extension class for students who are either high achieving or more curious about the other topics. So I think most people are already familiar with that. Section B, however, is more of a genuine choice. You choose only one. And I want to emphasize only one, because during a mock, students had written two. And these were you know, pretty aware students usually, but for some reason they wrote two, despite all the warnings beforehand. If you write two, the likeliest situation is that the examiner is going to read only the first one, and you're robbing yourself of a lot of time. So I can't say it enough, choose only one. And again, you have four specialist options. Usually only two are attractive to you. There might be a third option to look at just in case if you don't like the other two, but we'll talk about that very special situation towards the end of the video. For the most part, you're gonna look at the two areas that you covered with your teacher. The first part is more about subject content. So you either know it or you don't know it. Okay, whereas section B is more about the application of methodological ideas usually. And so even if you never sat A level, you could answer a lot of those questions based on your, um, your AS experiences. So it's very transferable to paper two from last year. So in the case of my students, they're probably gonna choose clinical and health. And then for section B, they could choose one and again, choose only one. Let's go to section A. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on section A. I just want to help you appreciate what's going to happen. So as I said, I was disappointed that there were no key studies in paper three. However, it's almost a guarantee based upon the specimen that we had and the syllabus that the first question is going to be about a key study. So it'll start with the same five words, from the key study by. Is that five? From the key study by, yeah, that's five words. Those words will not change. What will change, however, is which of the key studies. 
So you have a one in five chance of um, guessing it right, but of course you should revise all the key studies for the, that were not mentioned on paper three. Okay. All right, the second half of section A is more about a general concept. So in this case, it's about case studies and how they're used to study fear disorders. Now, these are the more likely to be the EG studies. I call them the EG studies because on the syllabus they're listed as EGs, for example. And as I said in the paper three video, most teachers choose these studies to investigate because they're more readily available and they're also written about in all of the textbooks associated with this course. So for example, outline the psychodynamic explanation of phobias. That'll be a beautiful question to get because obviously there's only one person you should be talking about there and that'll be Freud and the little boy Hans. And so that'll be a gift question. I, I like this specimen because you know they're quirky and weird questions. Freeman, VR, that's weird and quirky. And you have here um, case studies about phobia. You know, maybe with our luck, we'll get something a little less quirky or easy, something like imaginal desensitization or covert sensitization or something like that. But long story short, that's the breakdown. Okay, so that's what to expect in section A. I want to spend most of my time talking about section B because section A, again, is more about content. You either know it or you don't know it. So again, section B has a genuine choice. So students at our school are going to choose either clinical or health. Which one do I choose? Which one should I pick? The temptation would be to look at part A and figure out which one is easier based upon part A. But honestly, by this point, they both should be equally manageable because this is about methodology. We've been doing methodology for two years. So I feel equally confident about schizophrenia and antipsychotic investigations as I do about rational non-adherence investigations because the main point of part A is not necessarily the content of those ideas, but can I actually implement methodological um, know-how to investigate it? So I really feel it doesn't matter, for me personally at least, which one you choose. So which one am I going to pick? Well, I'm going to pick the one not based on part A, but actually on part B. And the reason for that is that part B is eight points dependent upon what inspired you to do what you had done. So for example, when it comes to schizophrenia and antipsychotics, I ask myself, well, I know about antipsychotics. I know about first generation and second generation antipsychotics. I know a little bit about the mechanisms that are occurring between neurons and dopamine and stuff like that but I might not know a study, and that's going to make it much harder for me to write about it because I want to be inspired to kind of borrow some methodology from something I've already read. So the syllabus does not indicate a study for this. There's no EG, there's no including a study. Your teacher probably included one, right, or maybe briefly mentioned one, but in this case, I'm not feeling very good about part B. However, for the second choice, part B, which is the same exact wording, by the way, will be easier for me because maybe I recently read the LABA et al. study. And because of that, I feel more confident about borrowing ideas for my own design. So that's going to be my choice. All right, so again, that is more about not just psychological knowledge, but I could also steal some things methodologically speaking, in my design. So for example, I could use a discrete choice experiment, or I could choose the same categories of reasons to not adhere, such as alcohol restrictions, early death, how it's taken, etc. Let me go back to the earlier slide because there's one thing that I think is a confusion for not just students, but for teachers. Part B is broken down into two parts one Roman numeral one Roman numeral two and I've gotten this question many times it's probably one of the most frequently asked questions what is the difference between one and two describing the psychological knowledge and explaining how two features of that knowledge was used to plan my study honestly there's not a lot of guidance there's not a lot of guidance in the specimen paper there's not a lot of guidance on the syllabus as far as I could tell if you have a better idea let me know but my understanding, or my easy way of putting it, 
is that Roman numeral one is told in the third person. What did other people find out? Roman numeral two is explaining what you did. So that's the first person. I did this because, etc. So one is third person. That's confusing. The first is third person and the second is first person. If that's confusing, I'll say it one more time. What other people did, what you did, and why. The scheme for this is kind of on a rubric basis. It's not on a content basis. So um, if you want, have a look at the marking scheme rubric for paper four, and maybe that'll give you a little bit more of a clue. But if you have an idea that I don't, please let me know in the comments because this is one of the most mystifying parts of the exam for teachers and for students. Okay. Another thing to be attentive to are the musts. Your plan must include details about two things. Those could be any methodological features. In this particular case, it's about your sampling technique. You know, is it self-selecting, volunteer, opportunity, is it based on convenience, et cetera. And the second one is a directional or non-directional hypothesis. When students practice with this, oftentimes they would just say, my hypothesis is blah, 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 blah. Why not use the language they've already given you? Why not just be direct and say, my directional hypothesis is that people who take antipsychotic medication will show a reduction of positive symptoms for schizophrenia or something to that effect. Another mystifying part of this exam is what would happen if a must is missing. Now last year for paper two, you kind of had to guess the musts. It's really nice that they actually now are directly telling us what you must have. By the way, there are shoulds, but these are musts. So the rubric for high level and for all levels actually doesn't specify what happens if you're missing a must. So we just have to guess what would happen. My guess, just to be as cautionary as possible, is that maybe not more than half credit, but I don't think that's an accepted rule that's written anywhere. That's just my guess. Typically, if a must was missing from other exams, it usually meant half credit at best. So make sure you hit those musts in the like first paragraph, if it's appropriate. Sampling technique usually comes in the first paragraph or the first section, if you will. And then your hypothesis, of course, comes very early, because why would you give a hypothesis at the end of a study? So treat those bullet points like a checklist. Now, those are musts. What about shoulds? Let me give you this overwhelming graphic, um, because I think a lot of the shoulds are things that should be obvious. Um, for example, a lab experiment. Remember last year, if you didn't have an IV or DV, uh, you were not going to get full credit and make sure you label those IVs and DVs. So there are lots of words associated with lab experiment you should be using. For example, control or perhaps um, independent groups because we're doing drug testing and usually you don't do repeated measures with drug testing. So it's a big graphic, but again, this is kind of repackaged from the AS stuff. So it shouldn't be too overwhelming. In the case of an observation, am I using covert, overt, control, naturalistic, etc.? With observations, I recommend you know throwing as many of the binary choices out there as possible. Um, and interviews and all the rest of it is on the screen. Pause it, enjoy it, and you know make a poster and put it on your bedroom wall. There is one thing in particular though that really bugged me and bugged the students, and that was one of the questions on the specimen papers asked for an interview technique. How would you answer that question? Just take a moment, think about that. It doesn't matter if you study health or not, right? Plan a study using an interview to investigate age differences in rational non-adherence to medical requests. Ignore what the aim is and just think about conducting an interview and you must mention an interview technique. My first instinct would be to use some of that specialized jargon that we learned last year and that makes sense, right? We want to do a semi-structured interview, and then I can explain later why I chose a semi-structured if it's asked about, especially in Part C. So I might choose it because I want to be able to follow unexpected answers from participants or something like that. 
However, we learn the hard way that this does not count as a technique. I think it's a good idea, but this is actually considered a interview format. So there's a little bit of this game we have to play where we have to learn the jargon of Cambridge, not necessarily the jargon of psychology, um, because I often think format and technique could be easily confused words. So if I were a student, I would probably do this and think I've satisfied the bullet point. However, when they say technique, and this is outlined in the syllabus as well, they actually mean by what means did you conduct the interview? Did you do it in person, face to face? Did you do it by telephone? Maybe you did it using some online platform like Zoom or something like that. So be very careful with this. However, why not just put both? All right, you might accidentally do face to face anyway if you didn't know that technique and format were two different things. So long story short, when in doubt, give more than you think you need. That's always a good rule. Give more than you think you need. Speaking of giving more than you think you need, let me go back to here. Sometimes people ask me, how many features should I include in an essay? And I've seen top tier essays provided by Cambridge themselves that have about eight, um, but why not shoot for 10 if you could do 10? It's a little overwhelming. The important thing though is when you're mentioning certain things, don't just name drop. Don't just say, yeah, I'll do this, this, and this, but without explaining it. So for example, if I said, oh, I would use independent groups. Okay, great, you used a phrase like independent groups, but did you explain how this would be achieved, how participants would be randomly allocated? So don't do too many methodological features because if you do, it'll lead to listing. So only do methodological features when they're explained. All right, so don't just drop jargon. Explain the IV, how it was operationalized, explain the DV, et cetera. All right, but let me go back to my original point. So again, the word technique and format are two separate entities. Take a moment and look at this uh, slide, maybe pause it. But when it comes to technique, for questionnaires, you could do paper and pencil or online, okay? Maybe using some social media uh, site or something, or Survey Monkey or something like that. For interview, again, the technique is telephone or face-to-face, -face, and I would even include there some sort of online platform because we're, after all, in the 21st century. I haven't used my telephone for years. Well, not as a telephone. So, yeah, be aware of these things. All right, so that's one more piece of advice. Uh, and the last piece of advice I have is very special and probably not going to come up, but it's worth just noticing. One of the topics actually spans two different specialist options, and that is the idea of accidents at work. So I tell students, if you're not happy with either the clinical option or the health option in our case, just take a quick peek at organizations because there's a small chance, very small, they may ask something like uh, design experiment about the efficacy of token economies in dangerous work environments or something like that. And in that case, you could actually do part A, part B, and part C for the Fox et al. study. And the Fox et al. study would only come up in part B. The rest of it is pure methodology. So it's a really unlikely edge case, but it wouldn't take too long just to have a quick peek in case you want a third option that might be possible. I don't recommend doing that for anything else except the Fox study. So another way of saying that is if you studied health but not organizations, you might peak at organizations, or if you study organizations, not health, you might peak quickly at health. Again, very unlikely, but I figured it was worth mentioning for those people who find themselves desperate halfway through the exam. Okay, I hope this was as short as intended, and I hope you do well, and yeah, be awesome.